Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, today, as, as uh, mentioned, we're going to be talking about the rise of Mac malware, um, and we're going to be looking at this from the perspective of um, where we started from uh, and, and the transition um, through to where we are right now. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. First of all, uh, my name is Thomas Reed. Um, uh, I work for Malwarebytes. Uh, and even before working at Malwarebytes, I was doing a lot of um, malware collection, cataloging, you know, describing behaviors, that sort of thing. Uh, so I feel pretty confident in saying that I know of every piece of malware that anyone knows about that has hit Mac OS X uh, and some of what hit earlier systems. Um, so that's that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And just a, a quick little quote here from Terry Pratchett um, that underscores the importance of knowing where you're coming from. Uh, if you do not know where you come from, then you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you're probably going wrong. Uh, and so that kind of you know does illustrate the point here. You, you, we do want to keep in mind the, the history of Mac malware when we're thinking about um, where we are today. So first, we're just going to go on to a little brief history of Mac malware uh, before we start talking about what we're seeing today. And um, some of you will probably be looking at that date, 1982, and say, wait, wait, this isn't Mac malware, uh, which is technically true, um, but I find it very fascinating that this piece of malware, this uh, elk cloner, uh, it was the first major virus. Now, you know, it's not the first virus. There had been other viruses before that point, but this was the first one that really spread widely. And contrary to what most people think, it, it actually affected Apple II computers, not PCs. Um, you know, so so a lot of people have this conception that viruses began on the PC, and that's actually not true. They began um, in part on Apple hardware. Uh, an L cloner, like most viruses at the time, was really just a prank. Uh, it was designed to periodically, you know, I think at, at certain like maybe once every hundred boots or something like that it would display this little fun poem um, and, and it could cause some problems potentially you know it could cause crashes or that sort of thing but that was not its intent it was really just sort of a fun little prank uh, meant to just um, entertain people and illustrate that viruses were really possible so if we move forward a few years to 1988, we'll get to our first slightly more malicious piece of malware, Seven Dust. And this again was a virus, not a you know not a Trojan or one of these other uh, more more recent pieces of malware. And really, it was it was not uh, deliberately malicious for the most part, but it did. Um, delete some files in some versions of, of the malware. Um, it wasn't deleting them for, you know, the way that ransomware does today. It wasn't um, deleting them for profit or anything like that. It was just essentially a more malicious prank. And one really interesting thing about 7Dust is that it was polymorphic, meaning that it changed constantly and it was encrypted, the code was, was encrypted. And this is something that even today on Mac OS, we really don't see a huge amount of this. We do see some code encryption, some code obfuscation, but uh, you know, really 7Dust was kind of ahead of its times in that regard. Then uh, 1989, uh, was the release of or first appearance of a virus called WDEF. Uh, and this one, I have a particular 
connection to. This is actually the first piece of malware that I ever saw. Uh, I was actually working in a campus computer lab at the University of Georgia at the time, and not, not in 1989, but a few years later. And uh, a student brought up a floppy disk that he was having trouble uh, getting mounted on the desktop. And I don't remember now how I knew what the problem was, but I did and I, I knew how to fix it. Uh, and so I fixed it and went on my way. Um, so that, that was really my first experience with malware. And what this malware did is uh, at that time, uh, this was I think around the time of system six, uh, the, the every volume, every disk would have a desktop file. Uh, and this is kind of sort of like a .ds store file, uh, except that it also had some executable code in it. And every time you mounted a disk, it would run some code from that desktop file. So what WDEF did was it injected malicious code into that desktop file. Uh, and it, I say malicious, but it really wasn't truly malicious. It was just sort of a, you know, a proof of concept, you know, sort of thing that just was there for no purpose other than to spread. And spread it did. Um, the worst thing that it really did is cause some accidental crashes and corruption. Uh, you know, uh, obviously because it was modifying a file on the disk, it could potentially do worse than that accidentally. So then 1995, we saw the emergence of a new kind of threat, which was word macro viruses. And the first of these on the Mac was called Concept. Uh, these, these viruses, uh, they are still, they're, they're not really truly viruses, um, but these are still around today. Uh, the, obviously not the original form, but uh, you know, Visual Basic, um, macro malware is still a thing today in, in Microsoft Office. And this was really the first cross-platform malware. Uh, and it, because it could infect both Macs and Windows machines. Now the initial phase of, of this kind of malware was not actually malicious. It was just you know, more proof of concept than anything else. But as this kind of malware spread and reproduced, it did have a, a very unfortunate and negative side effect on the Mac community. And that was that it resulted in John Norstad, the developer of Disinfectant, for some of those who are sufficiently long in the tooth to remember it. Uh, John decided to retire disinfectant because it was unable to deal with word macro viruses. And since you know, there was this new class of malware that his software couldn't deal with, he felt it was better to discontinue it than to continue shipping it and leave people with a false sense of security. Uh, so it was a, a very sad thing when that happened. Disinfectant was one of my favorite programs back in the day. Uh, I ran it on all my Macs. So I, it, it was very unfortunate that this kind of malware essentially killed disinfectant. Now we've gone past uh, the original system one through nine. We're into OS 10 at this point. And when OS 10 was released in the year 2000, that basically killed all of this old malware that had been written for the older Mac systems. Uh, none of it would run on OS 10. So it took a few years before malware authors really started getting back up to speed on OS 10. But they did, of course, and one of the first releases on OS X was something called Renipo, uh, which is just opener spelled backwards. And this was a Trojan. Um, you, you had to be tricked into downloading and running it, uh, as all Trojans require. And this was really the first Mac backdoor. So this gave the, the person behind it, the ability to remotely control your computer over a network. 
Um, this was a little bit less of a threat at that time because most computers were not constantly connected to the internet. I think at that time I was still connecting through a modem, uh, which meant that I was only connected when I was tying up the phone line. <laughs> Um, but this backdoor, if you had it installed and were connected to the network, it could exfiltrate a lot of your data. Uh, so that's obviously malicious. That's not just prank malicious. This is outright, you know, theft malicious. So that's that's the first time we'd really seen that kind of behavior. Then a few years later, we saw RS plug, uh, also known as DNS changer. This is one of the most well-known pieces of malware on Mac OS. Um, it, it's one that also had a Windows variant, and it was really the first financial malware on Mac OS, uh, and, and it involved some phishing. So what this malware did is once it got installed on your system, it would change your DNS settings and keep them set to a malicious DNS server. And what that DNS server would do is, you know, say you tried to go to um, your bank website, for example. Um, when you type in the, the uh, correct address for your bank website, uh, the domain name lookup would happen, but it would send you to a, the wrong IP address. It would send you to the wrong site. And what would actually be at the, the malicious site would be a phishing page for that bank. Um, so this was really designed to um, to fish credentials from users and then use that to get access to financial data or other data. Um, and this was actually shut down by the FBI in 2009. They, um, they, they shut it down. They took over the, uh, the malicious DNS server and they ran that server as a legitimate DNS server for years because if they had shut it down, then everyone across the world who was infected with RS plug would have instantly had their network connection fail. So that's that's a, a, a this was really a, a very interesting piece of malware at the time and very widespread. In 2008, uh, an, a program called Mac Sweeper uh, appeared. This is no relation to Mac Keeper. Uh, and this was really the first Mac PUP or potentially unwanted program. We see these a lot now. You know, you've got things like Mac Keeper, Advanced Mac Cleaner, uh, you know, all these programs that are doing very similar things. But this was the first one. We had never seen a PUP on Mac OS before this, this tool. And like all the all of its successors, uh, this one is a or was a junk cleaning tool. It would try and use some scare tactics to convince you that your your system was just in terrible shape and you had to buy it in order to clean it up and make it work better. And it also used some sneaky methods for getting installed. Uh, so it was it was getting installed surreptitiously, not just uh, with user consent. Then in 2010, we saw a piece of malware called opinion spying. Now at the time, everybody was calling this spyware um, because this was doing things like monitoring your web browsing history and sending that data off to you know, who knows where. Um, our conception of what spyware is has changed significantly in the past 10 years. Uh, so we today would not call this spyware, we would call this adware. Um, and it is actually the oldest Mac malware of any kind uh, that is still operating today. The company behind this uh, is called Premier Opinion and they are still operating today. Um, you can still find their stuff getting installed by some of these adware installers. Uh, so the, they're really the, the oldest one out there. And originally, 
Uh, the, the first variant of this malware was found in a, a bunch of screensavers that were available on 7artscreensavers.com. So if you downloaded one of these screensavers and installed it, you were infected with Opinion Spy and your browsing history would be monitored from that point after. So we've seen sort of how the Mac threat landscape has migrated from, you know, starting out as more pranks all the way up through the emergence of all the, the kinds of threats that we see today, the, the actual backdoors, the financial malware, the, you know, pups, the adware, you know, all that kind of stuff. So let's take a look at where we are now. So we did some research. We looked into our numbers at Malwarebytes uh, last year, 2019, and we found some very interesting things. Uh, we found that Mac detections that we were seeing had gained quite a bit on Windows, um, and we were seeing about 14% of our overall detections were, were Mac detections. Um, we also saw, and this this is not a particularly striking statistic. You know, 14% is not not a huge number, but we have to you know we have to consider that we have a lot fewer Macs in our install base than we have Windows machines. We've got mil you know tens of millions of Windows machines. Uh, we have a substantially smaller number of Macs that have malware bytes installed. So this data is coming in from a smaller group. So of course the numbers are going to be lower, right? So what we did is we looked at the number of detections that we saw per endpoint. So per machine for each Mac on average, how many threats did we detect versus the same number for Windows? And what we found that was that Mac detections per machine were almost two times higher than Windows. Uh, now, obviously, this is just Malwarebytes data, so it's we can't say whether this is you know universal across everybody who's monitoring this sort of thing, or if it's something specific about our particular customers, or you know who knows. But this is what we saw, and we also saw that the Mac detections in our data were about four times higher in 2019 than they were in 2018. So if we dive a little deeper here and look at the top Mac, Mac threats that we saw last year in all of 2019, you'll notice here that two of them, adware.newtab and pup.pcvar, those are almost 50% of the pie. Uh, so so they, they took up the majority of the detections um, well, not the majority. They, they took up almost a majority of the detections just between the two of them. And if you look at the top 10, they make up a total of 84.2% of all of our detections. Um, and if we look at the names of all those, you'll notice that they all start with Adware or PUP, uh, with one exception, osx.genio, that we'll talk a little bit more about that one uh, shortly, but that one's technically adware. Uh, it, it does have the OSX extension, you know, uh, prefix, which means malware, but it's it's really just adware. So all 10 of these are all pups and, and adware. And then we've got that other little slice of pie there. And out of that slice of pie for everything else, actual malware is a very small part of it. Um, the most common single piece of malware that we see is only about three tenths of one percent of our total detections. So really, I mean, malware is a small part of what we see on, on Mac. Most of what we see is adware and pups. So let's go beyond 2019 now and take a look at what we're seeing in 2020 so far. Now, I say that this is the top malware of 2020 so far because it has changed just since the end, of, you know, just since January. Um, 
And so I fully expect that this will continue changing and evolving throughout the course of this year. So what I say today is the top malware may not be the top malware by the time we hit December. So the, the very one of the very top pieces of malware that we see in the largest numbers is something called bird miner. And this is a crypto miner. Uh, so basically it's a it's a, uh, a piece of malware that uses your computer's processor time to mine uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, in this case, it's mining Monero, which is, uh, you know, just a, a variant of, of a cryptocurrency. And this malware was distributed via piracy of a large number of audio apps, uh, all coming from, well, mostly coming from this VST uh, crack site. Uh, and it has a large number of uh, of downloads there that you can you can get and and they they're you know all infected so you go pirate these audio apps and you get yourself infected now there are a few very interesting things about bird miner uh, one of those is that it does some some fairly basic analysis avoidance uh, and a lot of malware does this these days um, you know the the techniques vary with bird miner what uh, what was really interesting to see was that um it would monitor for activity monitor and if you happen to open activity monitor at any point it would unload the software and uh you know suddenly whatever crypto mining process was taking up a lot of your processor time would no longer be running uh, so if you're suspicious, you're wondering why your computer's fans are running so fast and you're trying to go in there and look at activity monitor to see who the culprit is, you're not going to find it because it's gone by the time activity monitor starts showing you results. And then, of course, when you reboot the machine, it's going to load right back up again. Uh, it would also do the exactly the same thing if the minor CPU usage went above 85%. Uh, because, you know, if obviously it's trying to stay under the radar, uh, if it if it starts using too much processor time, then the user is going to get suspicious and start poking at things and maybe find the malware. It also has a very interesting method of code obfuscation. Um, you know, a lot of malware will obfuscate the code somehow. It will hide the strings. Uh, and, and other things, um, function names, and you know that sorts of things, um, because really strings are they're easy to extract from a a, a a binary, and you know if you're if you're writing antivirus software, they're it, it, using a string found in the code is really easy. It's a really easy way to do a detection. So a lot of malware these days tries to obfuscate or encrypt those strings somehow. Well, with Birdliner, they didn't actually write any obfuscation code. What they did was they installed a program called QEMU. And this is a general purpose uh, machine emulator, you know, so it's kind of like Parallels or VMware. And along with that, they also installed a tiny core Linux VM file. And they would use QEMU to load up that, that tiny core VM and start it running. And that VM, uh, if you pop it open and take a look at what's going on, uh, there is a startup script in the, the system that will run the XM rig miner, which mines Monero. Uh, and so that's how this is going. You, you wouldn't see that XM rig is running on the system. If you were to look at it, you know, at something like you couldn't look at activity monitor, but if you looked at, say, top or PS uh, in the terminal, you wouldn't see XM rig running anywhere. Um, you wouldn't see QEMU either as it was given a, a different name. And so you might be kind of puzzled as to what's going on here. Uh, the one big disadvantage with this is that it this there's a lot of overhead. I mean, when you inst when it installs, it installs QEMU and a just ton of dependencies. 
So your your user local bin and other directories are just going to fill up with all of this crud that wasn't there before. Uh, plus, on top of that, it's going to install this you know hundred plus megabyte tiny core VM file. So it's very noisy when it when it gets installed. And there have been many different variants of this since we first detected it. Uh, we first detected this in June of last year. And as you can see from this graph here, we continue to see it. Uh, you know, it, the, the rates at which we see it have gone up and down, but it's there hasn't been a single month where we've seen uh, none of it since June. So we're still seeing a lot of these. We're still seeing new variants appear, and it's really near the top of our malware detections. So another piece of malware and this is really a group of pieces of malware, is malware associated with the, the uh, Lazarus APT group, uh, APT meaning Advanced Persistent Threat. Uh, this is a North Korean hacking group that, that creates nation state malware. Um, and some of the pieces of malware they've, they've created have been Fall Chill, um, Gamera, and Dackle's rat. Uh, so these are all different pieces of Lazarus malware. Um, and I've got this screenshot here. This is from one particular piece of, of Lazarus malware, one particular variant of the fall chill malware. And I just love this screenshot because it's so creepy. I mean, it's 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 just it looks like a, you know something out of a horror movie or something. Um, so there have been a very wide variety of different apps. These, these, interestingly, these are all Trojans. So the user has to be tricked into uh, into opening something in order to get in, to get infected. And there, the apps that cause the infection have been stock trading apps, as you can see in this, um, uh, are actually the stock trading apps as well as cryptocurrency apps. This one was a cryptocurrency app shown in the picture here. Uh, there was an album app. That was what that previous screenshot was. It was a, a, an album that showed some questionable pictures, uh, which is why most people would be downloading it. Um, there was recently a, a um, an app that would generate time-based one-time passwords for your two-factor authentication. So it was something like, you know, Authy or Google Authenticator, except it was not legit and it installed malware on the system. Uh, and then one early version of, of Lazarus malware actually came in, in, in a booby-trapped malicious Word document. Um, that one was a little less effective because it relied on getting out of a sandbox, which was not, uh, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't able to continue doing that. So what Lazarus does in general is collect some basic system information and exfiltrate it and install a backdoor. And then once that back door is installed, the, the folks behind it can execute arbitrary commands on your system. Uh, you can see here a little snippet of bash code here that sets up a, a, a reverse shell. Um, and this basically gives, uh, it opens up a port on your computer through which the, uh, the malware creator can send commands back to your Mac. And, and they, you know, it's basically like they've used something like SSH to connect to your Mac and are issuing commands. Uh, so it's very, very arbitrary. There's, there's not a lot limiting what they can do with this. So uh, that's kind of the, the top of the malware that we're seeing. There, there are some others. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing is being caught by generic rules or is being caught in fairly small volumes. Um, but as you can see, there's, you know, there's some interesting malware, but there's not a lot of malware for Mac. So let's take a look at the top adware.
for, for 2020 so far. Now, in 2019, new tab was the at, at literally at the top of, of our Mac detections. It's fallen down a, a notch to second place in 2020. So um, it is still very prevalent, but it's, it's not as prevalent as it had been in 2019. So basically what new tab does is it, it tries to trick the user into downloading and installing some app. And that app will include a Safari app extension. Um, so obviously these, uh, these extensions will only work on Mojave and Catalina at the moment. So that's all the malware supports. Uh, you can see here in this screenshot, uh, a site called packagemanager.net. Uh, if you went to this site and entered a tracking number here, it didn't matter what number you entered. You could enter anything you wanted to. It doesn't even have to be a number. Um, you know, you could say you could enter my dog has fleas and it would still give you a download for an app. Um, so whatever you type in there, you get the app. Um, if you install it, then you're going to get this new extension into Safari. Now, um, less frequently, we have seen some Chrome extensions that are associated with the same group. Uh, th that's not as common, uh, but it does happen. And this is really fairly typical adware. It's really oriented towards changing your search settings, you know, changing your home page, doing some search redirects, that sort of thing. Um, so it's not particularly interesting. It's very prolific, but not really all that interesting. And it's it's come by a just a huge number of names. You know, I've got just a few names listed here. You know, things like complete ready, display success, extra device. I mean, these are kind of bland, generic, meaningless names. Uh, and and there are just literally hundreds of these names out there for new tab. Um, what's really really amusing to me is that all these apps have only one of two app icons. So it doesn't matter what the name is. If you see one of these two icons on an app, delete it. It's, ad, it, it's adware, it's new tab. Um, so it's, it's not, as you might expect, it's not the most sophisticated adware out there, uh, but, but man, they really are distributing it really, really well. So let's look at, Genio. Uh, this is a really old one. This one's been active since 2013. Uh, so they, they've been around for a while. It's um, the original company was actually named Genio and they're, they were an Israeli company. Uh, the, the company itself has changed its name several times. At one point they changed their name to Innkeeper which was misspelled. It was missing the, the, the E near the end. Um, and then at, at some point, they also got acquired by a company named Somoto. Uh, it's unclear exactly who owns it at this point, whether it's still Somoto or someone else. They've kind of uh, covered their tracks up a little bit more in recent years. So it's harder to tell where they are now, if they're still, you know, the same people or not. Um, most likely they are, most likely they're still in Israel. We just don't know what they're called now. And uh, just as the company keeps changing, so does the malware. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly changing and it has been since 2013. We've seen a lot of really interesting tricks that they have tried um, and used very successfully. So as I mentioned earlier, this is we give this the prefix for malware, uh, but really it's it's actually just adware. Uh, and where we're where we're coming up with that differentiation is uh, malware is something that targets you. If it's infecting your machine, it's it's trying to get your data 
It's trying to use your computer's CPU cycles, you know, or, or whatever, whatever it's doing, it's, a, it's targeting you. Uh, adware, on the other hand, is targeting advertising, uh, uh, you know, advertising systems. It's targeting affiliate programs. It's targeting search engines. Uh, so, so you are not the direct uh, victim of adware. Now, sure, it's annoying. It's it's really bothersome, and it can actually open up some security holes on your computer. But you're not really the intended victim. The adware is not doing anything intentionally malicious to you other than harassing you. So why do we call, why did we give it this malware prefix? Um, this is one of the reasons here is because it has used vulnerabilities to get installed at various times in the past. So uh, this is just illustrating two of the tricks they've used um, here on the, the right side. You can see uh, some disassembled code here um for how they would get the safari extension installed uh, and this was back in the day of you know dot safari extz files you'd double click them and then you'd have to click an allow button to enable them to in safari and so what they would do is they would actually monitor for that window to pop up that allow you know the, the window with the allow or don't allow buttons and then it would calculate the position of the, the allow button and it would generate three mouse events, one to move the mouse there, one to, to send a mouse down and one to send a mouse up. And so it would simulate a click on that allow button. Uh, as a direct result of this kind of thing going on, Apple has locked down access to those dialogues. You can no longer click on those with any kind of simulated click, including through screen sharing. Uh, so that's if you've ever tried to activate a kernel extension, for example, um, remotely through screen sharing, this is why you can't. Genio is why we cannot have nice things. Uh, another vulnerability they used is one called DYLD print to file. And this was a vulnerability that was found where you could set a an environment variable and trick the system into running a command with root permissions. And so here you could see that what, uh, what Genio did with that is they used it to write a line into the sudoers file to allow all users to use sudo with no password at all. Uh, and so they, they did that and then used sudo at that point, which they could use without a password, to install all their components. So there was no need for asking the user's password. Um, it was completely touchless. And uh, of course, you know, that, that's a major violation right there, using a vulnerability to get installed. Um, they've also used some very misleading file names recently. Uh, so this is a screenshot of some some of the uh, the files we've seen dropped on endpoints. Uh, as you can see, there's some some big names there: Aspire, uh, Rosetta Stone, Dashlane. Those are all legitimate programs. Uh, Monero Wallet GUI. That sounds like something that could be a legitimate program if you're into cryptocurrency. Um, and, and of course, the one that I find really amusing is Mac Keeper. Now. Why on earth would you put the name Mac Keeper on something malicious that you're trying to hide? That's like just shining a spotlight on it and saying, hey, look at me, look over here. Because um, I, I would imagine that all of you as Mac admins, if you saw anything with the name of Mac Keeper on your system, you would instantly delete it. Um, so I'm not sure why they chose that name, but it, it that one really amuses me. Uh, another piece of very prominent adware that we're seeing is called CrossRider, and this has used a really wide variety of invasive techniques. It's been around almost as long as Genio, so it's it's also uh, if if anything, it's actually a lot more sophisticated than Genio. Um, and some of the things that CrossRider has done are password phishing, 
uh, interception of network data, exfiltration of user data, uh, and again, using exploits to get installed. Now, why didn't we call this one malware when it's using exploits? It really has to do with the timeline. Um, you know, Genio was using those exploits very early on. And so, you know, when we, uh, when I arrived at Malwarebytes and we were creating the detections for Genio, we called it, we used the malware prefix. Crosswriter didn't start doing that kind of stuff until later. We were already calling it adware.crosswriter, so we didn't want to change the name. That wouldn't mess with our telemetry data and we'd have less ability to track it accurately. Um, so one thing that we've seen Crosswriter do is fascinating. I've never seen any other piece of malware or adware do this. They copied Safari into a folder in the temp folder. Then they modified a couple of files inside that Safari app bundle. One of those was a JavaScript file that gets run when you open Safari. So of course, then the next step they did was they open Safari. That JavaScript file runs and does what it's meant to do, which is really just to install an extension into Safari. Uh, and then they close the app and delete it. And boom, next time you open Safari, you've got this new in extension installed that wasn't there before. And um, they did this without making you click an allow button or anything else. Now, uh, some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, if you modify Safari, doesn't that invalidate its code signature and break it and cause it to not run? That's a very good question. Uh, and that's actually the subject of, of something that I talked about uh, at multiple different conferences a, a couple of years ago. So let's just take a little look uh, at uh, a, a proof of concept that I created uh, on how to abuse a code signature and still run. So as you can see here, this is running on the latest version of Catalina and we've got the latest version of Chrome. It doesn't have to be Chrome. Um, you know, I, I'm not picking on Chrome specifically. You can do this with many different apps. And so uh, I open up the terminal and I run this infector shell script. Um, now, because it's on the desktop folder, we need to get access to the desktop. And then look at that. When we open up Chrome, the calculator pops open, which is not supposed to happen. So this is just an illustration that if an app is already installed on your system, you've already opened it in the past, its code signature is not going to get checked again, even on the latest version of Catalina. And so if something modifies that code to be malicious, you're still going to be able to open up that app and run it. Uh, and so that's what happened here when when this cross rider adware modified that copy of Safari, it did invalidate the code signature, but it was still allowed to open and run. Uh, so that's that's pretty malicious, but very, very interesting, I thought. Uh, so another one near the top of our, our detections is one called vSearch. Uh, this one is about as old as Genio as well. Uh, originally, when I started tracking this back, back in the day, uh, it, I was referring to it as downlight because of the name of the, uh, the, the thing it was masquerading as. Uh, but that really wasn't the the correct name so um, i switched it over to vsearch that's what we call it to today uh, it's also known as purit or perit i don't know how you pronounce it um, and if you're if you're interested in a really detailed teardown of of this malware uh, you should go google uh, amit serper pirate and you'll find several different detailed documents that he's written papers on exactly what this malware has been doing, you know, how it works, that sort of thing. It's it's the definitive read if you want to understand this malware. Uh, and it's it uses a lot of 
different names for drop files. Now, this is not something new. For example, we, we talked about that with, um, with Genio a little bit, some of those weird file names. We talked about this with new tab and all the different app names. VSearch kind of it took this to another level by reading words out of the the words file in user share dict. And uh, that file, if I remember correctly, has over 600,000 words in it. VSearch would pick one and that would be the name of the file that it would install. So this this malware was really impossible to detect by name at all. Um, in fact, this was actually this this malware actually triggered some changes in at the time the way I had Adware Medic uh, uh, detections working. Um, so here you can just see you know a little snippet of a shell script that takes care of installing this this software um, you know uh, it, it downloads this stuff um, installs it you know extra or extracts it then installs it puts in a launch daemon um, that sort of thing now vSearch has also got a long long history of malware behavior as you can tell from this osx extension or prefix on there it's it's been acting badly since before I worked at Malwarebytes. And um, one really interesting thing about this is that uh, at the time, Apple really wasn't doing much about adware with, with Xprotect. Uh, you know, Xprotect was really strictly just for malware. Until vSearch did uh, started uh, blocking some sites like the Adware Medic website that tried to help the user remove it. So what exactly was it doing? Let's take a look and see at, at this video. So here you can see the Adware Medic website loaded up in Safari, but when you try and reload it, you can see the page flash up, but then it disappears again. That's because the malware was actually modifying the, the loaded HTML and making it look like the page couldn't be loaded. Uh, it was also modifying the, the HTML code if you went to the Safe Mac website. Look at that. You click on an article and it opens the Mac Keeper website of all places. Uh, kind of ironic given the top article that was displayed there at the time. Um, so when we discovered about this and I, I reported this to Apple, um, that's kind of that was the turning point where Apple uh, added vSearch detections to Xprotect. So we've talked about some really nasty tricks that that Adware has used. Let's look in detail at some, what some of those some other tricks have been. Um, so we talked about copying Safari. Um, in that case, in, in um, uh, Crossrider, the reason the user never actually saw anything was that they saw this, this is what their screen looked like during that time. So it just had this little window across that said, installation in progress, please wait. Doesn't look like there's really anything suspicious going on. Uh, although you do have to kind of wonder where the desktop icons went, if you're paying attention to that sort of thing, and the open windows. Um, so basically it was obscuring the whole screen so that the user would never see Safari pop open and closed, that, that copy of Safari. Um, we're also seeing malicious profiles getting installed a lot lately. Uh, and Basically, these are uh, system configuration profiles. They appear in the, the profiles pane of system preferences, and their, their purpose is to lock Safari and or Chrome to specific home page and search engine settings. And once that's been done, the user really can't change those settings. It's grayed out in preferences. They can't go in and change it because it's essentially managed. Uh, and so the only way to change those settings is to go and delete this profile. 
Unfortunately, there are no APIs for managing these profiles. So, um, you know, for software like Malwarebytes or uh, any other antivirus software, there's no safe way to go and remove these things or detect them. Uh, so they're kind of a problem. We, we see a lot of people these days who are infected. Uh, they get mad because we can't solve the problem. And, and you know, it's, it's honestly understandable. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still kind of crossing my fingers that Apple will lock this down a little tighter in the next version of Mac OS so that you can no longer install profiles from the command line. Uh, but we will see. Um, and there are a variety of different websites that are used here. This particular example used searchmine.net, which is a, a, a malicious site associated with this adware. Uh, but there are lots and lots and lots of others. Uh, we've also seen some use of Chrome managed preferences, uh, and, and these really kind of have the same effect as the profiles. Uh, they, they cause Chrome to have its settings locked down and, and become unchangeable by the user. Uh, this is we see this mostly on older systems, not on current systems. And uh, basically, it involves writing some preference files into the library slash managed preferences folder. And once that's been done, that's not even something that before this year I knew existed. And then we started seeing uh, some some adware using this trick to uh, to lock down those settings. Uh, Sudor's file changes. We mentioned that uh, a little bit earlier with regard to Genio, uh, but Genio is not the only one out there that makes Sudor's file changes. Um, and, and in all cases, they try to make the, these changes to, uh, to enable their software to have prolonged continued root access. Now, the bad news there is that this can open up a serious security hole on your system. Uh, it, can, it can cause a, a vulnerability, essentially. Um, what we've seen is that some adware will actually try to give uh, these additional permissions to a particular process, uh, like this MyMac up-to-date process in, in the top case. Uh, it, in such a case, if you were able to replace that process, you could potentially have root permissions with that, you know, with, with a malicious uh, replacement for that process. Uh, other pieces of adware or malware have actually removed all restrictions. They've allowed all users to use sudo all the time with no password. Um, and that when it happens is quite dangerous because it means that if I'm writing malware and distributing it, one of the things that I might want to do is as soon as my malware is starting to get installed, I look at the sudoers file. And if I see that I can get root permissions without asking, then I do that. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it really opens up a serious security hole on your system that could lead to any other software in the future installing with no prompts, no, you know, no privilege um, requests or anything like that. We also see man in the middle attacks happening. Uh, and this is in the case of malware obviously done to intercept the network data and steal it. In the case of adware, it's done for the reverse purpose in order to inject into the ad, the, the network traffic, uh, in order to inject ads into the feeds. Uh, and the most common way that this is happening right now is through an open source program called MITM Proxy. Uh, this is completely legit. It's, it's a legitimate tool that web developers uh, may use to uh, to help them with debugging and that sort of thing. Uh, but it obviously can be misused and it is being misused. Uh, so if you see this on a system where it really shouldn't be, where there's no reason for it, you should definitely remove it. However, removal causes a little bit of a problem in that 
if you remove the MITM proxy uh, software, then the proxy settings are still there trying to send network data through a non-existent process. And as a result, uh, you lose network connectivity. Uh, so in order to fix that, you've just got to go into your proxy settings in, in system preferences in the network pane uh, and just clear everything, clear all those, those settings. We also see a lot of data collection from adware. You know, a, a lot of this is not really hugely harmful, uh, but you know, things like your username, um, all the installed software on your system, um, you know, that sort of thing, you know, sometimes browser history. Those aren't things you necessarily want to share. Uh, and one thing that I find really interesting that we've seen some adware do is get the version of Apple's malware removal tool from the system. Um, I'm not sure why they're doing that. I'm guessing that maybe they don't want to install certain things if MRT is, is at a certain version, but that's a guess. So real quick, let's take a look at some of the top pups of 2020 so far. Uh, and last year, the absolute top pup was PC Bark. Uh, we're going to see some changes this year. We, we're seeing that it has shifted. So the absolute top pup this year is Mac Booster. And this has been around a while. It's made by a company named IOBit. It's one of these junk cleaning tools that tries to scare you like in this case on a completely clean system here it says that the system set status is dangerous um, so it clearly uses scare tactics to try and get people to buy uh, <clears throat> worse <coughs> excuse me worse though is the fact that they're doing uh, tech support scams. <clears throat> so if you go to this link that I've, I've got listed here, um, you can actually listen in on a conversation that I had with a Mac, uh, an IOBit uh, support representative. And that representative got access to my test computer that I was giving him access to. And he proceeded to try and trick me into thinking that it was infected with all kinds of stuff uh, and that I needed to pay them for service to remove it. Um, so that's blatantly illegal. The only reason that Mac Booster and IOBit still exist is that IOBit is in a country that doesn't care about prosecuting them. Uh, the FBI is well aware of this company uh, and, and what they're doing. And so this one actually has even replaced new tab, which was at the top of our detections. It is in first place now in all of our detections across the board. I don't know what changed that made it happen. Uh, JDI is another one. JDI, which stands for Just Do It. Um, they're a development company that makes uh, uh, some backup apps. You may have heard of some of these Zip Cloud, Just Cloud, and My PC Backup. At one point between Zip Cloud and Just Cloud, we were seeing those two in about 75% of all adware installers, all of them. You know, so this this was hugely prolific and widespread. Uh, they also make a couple junk antivirus apps, ScanGuard and Total AV. Uh, and so we detect all of those and, and remove them. Um, you can actually see here in the, the image here, back a number of years ago, they were even using some, some pretty scammy techniques to get their, their stuff installed. Um, so we detect these, and this is this is now near the top of our, our pup list. This is our, our second most detected pup now. Mac Reviver is our third most common pup. Um, it's mostly unchanged since it first appeared in 2016. This uh, screenshot here is actually one that was taken in 2016. If you go and install the software, today, and I actually did that just a few days ago just to make sure I was telling the truth, it would look almost identical to this. 
so it really hasn't changed at all. Um, so it's uh, it's actually moved up. Uh, sorry, I said third. It's fourth place. It's moved up from ninth place to fourth place. Again, I don't know why this one has become so much more prolific uh, in the last six months. Um, but but that's that's what the data is showing. And then finally, we've got PC Vark. Uh, they were in first place uh for pups second place overall last year um they've fallen off to fifth place now and pc vark is actually uh there there are multiple different companies much like genio has changed names pc vark has sort of spawned off a number of different companies they they have names like pc vark uh, techie utils innovana think labs um, and they are a hugely prolific pup maker. Their flagship pup, their original, is Advanced Mac Cleaner, uh, but it is far from the only one. They have dozens, if not hundreds, of different variants of this same app. They're all clones of Advanced Mac Cleaner. Um, I've seen a few that have had some updated UI, but for the most part, they have still, you know, they have the same UI that Advanced Mac Cleaner always has. Um, and it, it, they're they're hugely, hugely prolific, and they they've really been near the top of our detections for a very long time. Uh, but interestingly, some other companies are now beating them to the punch, beating them into you know the the top. Uh, top positions in our detections. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what changed, but uh, I fully expect that in the next six months by December, things may have shaken up yet again. And that's it. That's what we're seeing in the largest numbers today. Uh, I'm, I'm open for any questions if anybody has any. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, let's go to the Q&A. So, um, let's see, top of the list. You're stuck on a deserted island, maybe, and you had to rely on one tip or trick to save your computer from malware. Uh, what would that be? And can you ever really remove malware on Mac OS? Uh, well, let me take the Second part first. Yes, you definitely can remove malware on Mac OS. Um, you know, it's uh, I know on Windows it can get pretty ingrained into the system uh, with system integrity protection on Mac uh, and some of the other security features that's harder to do um, on Mac OS. So yeah, you definitely can remove it. Um, uh, you know, it, it, there, there can sometimes be cases where something's really, really particularly nasty and you just have to re-image. Um, but fortunately, those are few and far between. Um, now, as for the top thing to do, um, honestly, the, the best thing that you can do uh, to keep your Mac safe is just be aware of what you're downloading at all times. You know, and, and I, I'm uh, for, for Mac admins, for the, the audience here, I'm sure that's probably something easy to do. The trick is how do we tell you the average user how to do that. It's, it's something that's very difficult for them to understand, very, you know, very difficult to for them to know what's legit and what's not. Um, but but if you can do it, the best thing you can do to keep your Mac safe is just be careful what you're downloading. Don't download pirated stuff, you know, don't click on weird links. Um, you, you know, always go to the original developer site to download something rather than from somewhere like download.com. Okay, fantastic. Um, any recommendations on getting rid of potentially unwanted applications? Now, maybe you just answered that, but. Yeah, uh, pups are, they're usually pretty easy to get rid of. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely, they can be hard to identify sometimes. And by far and away, pups are one of the biggest things that people uh, get upset about. They, they get upset that we're detecting something that they think is legitimate, like Mac Keeper, 
We get a lot of tickets from people saying, oh, why are you detecting this legitimate software? We're like, it's not legitimate software. If your antivirus is detecting it, there's a reason. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're usually fairly easy to remove. They're not quite as invasive in their install procedures as adware or malware typically can be. Um, the, the trick is just finding all the various launch agents and daemons that may have been installed. And as long as you get those and you get the app itself, uh, maybe look through the application support folders for anything, any little leftovers. That's really all that's required for a pup. Um, you know, and obviously, I, I mean, I work for Malwarebytes. That's part of our bread and butter is removing this stuff. So, you know, we're, we, that, that does great if you don't want to do the work of actually looking through for all this stuff and figuring out what's good and what's bad. But honestly, you know, a, 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 Mac, a Mac admin like the folks listening, they, they would be perfectly capable of removing it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Apple puts out security updates that we push over FileWave. How far is Apple behind malware bytes in days, months, years in keeping up with the threats? You know, I would not necessarily say that they're behind or ahead. Um, sometimes we're ahead of them, sometimes they're ahead of us. Um, it just depends. The one thing that they, um, where there is a big difference consistently is that uh, with, with respect to how Apple handles threats through things like XProtect and uh, the malware removal tool, they really don't target pups at all. Like they, they do not detect uh, Mac Keeper, you know, even though every Mac admin in the world would probably ask them to, they, 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 um, they don't. Um, I think that they may detect one variant of a PC Vark app, um, but that's the extent of their pub detections. Um, similarly with adware, they really are only detecting a, a small subset of the adware threat landscape. Um, so the, the main focus of their, uh, their detections, their, their user protections focus on malware, uh, which is a, a very good place to focus, uh, but it's also the smallest part of the threat landscape on the Mac. Okay, um, we had another comment. Good info uh, new ma uh, uh, on new malware attacks. You mentioned that 3% of malware is really malicious on Mac OS. Um, I for forgot your terms in parentheses. Can you share similar numbers for Windows? I probably could if I looked them up. I'd have to, I, I don't know what they are off, uh, off the top of my head, and I, I'm not really an expert on the Windows side. Very good. It's definitely a higher number, though, much higher. Now, now Windows also does have similar problems with adware and pups. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, Windows has got problems like ransomware that we just don't have on Mac OS. You, you know, uh, other than a brief flirtation with ransomware back in around 2016, we really haven't seen any. And none of what we saw in 2016 was particularly successful. Um, so so the numbers of, of actual malicious stuff affecting Windows is much, much higher. I just don't know the number off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, can, can you tell us anything about what happens to the companies and individuals who make these malware? Yeah, so for the most part, they get away with it scot-free. You know, with a, the exception of malware, sometimes those folks get caught. Um, but the folks that are behind adware and pups, um, you know, especially with pups, they are so-called legit software as far as the law is concerned. Um, you know, I think Mac Keeper had a class action lawsuit that went against them. Uh, but that was that was a, a civil suit, not a criminal suit. Uh, so as far as criminal charges, pup makers are not doing anything wrong in the eyes of the law. Um, similarly, adware, uh, it, it breaks some laws sometimes, like using vulnerabilities to get installed. Um, but for the most part, it's not really something that law enforcement is that interested in. So. It, Malware, though, that's another story. Um, 
you know, I, if if any of you saw my talk at uh, Objective by the Sea this year, um, we actually have a, a story about a guy who was caught, the guy who wrote the fruit fly malware was caught and is currently uh, in prison in Cleveland um, with, the, with the trial ongoing right now. Um, so that's a fascinating story. Fantastic. Um, can you tell us, it, was Malwarebytes able to help any small cities and organizations avoid ransomware? Um, I'm assuming since there wasn't a big impact on ransomware, there wasn't much that was going on on the Mac side there. Yeah, yeah, nothing really on the Mac side because there hasn't been an outbreak. But yeah, the um, uh, our, our researchers on the Windows side are, are constantly uh, trying to help out anybody that they can with ransomware. You know, they help out small groups that, that can't afford the remediation, can't afford to pay ransom. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, they've they've actually been able to uh, find ways of decrypting files. Uh, not in every case, but uh, but but yeah, uh, our researchers can either. Um, figure out how to decrypt the files themselves or are able to um, use other people's research and then go and help people who have had their files encrypted. Nice. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, what are the top five mistakes made by the average users? Top five mistakes. Um, First, I would say is installing Flash Player <laughs> or what they think is Flash Player. Um, that's probably the most common way of getting yourself infected these days is, is clicking on a, you know, you need Flash Player to view this content link and, and installing whatever it gives you. Um, uh, I would say another one is uh, engaging in piracy. Uh, you know, as we mentioned with the, the bird miner malware, that's it, it's a recurring theme that we see a lot, both on Windows and Mac, is if you engage in piracy, eventually you're going to get caught. You're going to get hit with malware. Um, uh, I would say maybe that the, uh, the next most, the next biggest mistake would be just not backing up their computer. Uh, I see a lot of people that don't have backups. Um, on the Windows side, I've seen some very tragic cases of people who um, got hit with ransomware and had no backups and couldn't afford the ransom or didn't want to pay the ransom. Um, so that's always bad. If you if you have good backups, then you really have very little fear from that kind of destructive malware. Um, uh, let's see, two more. Um, or maybe one more. Yeah, um, let's see, one more. Those are really the big ones. Um, uh, yeah, I guess another one is reuse of passwords. That's a, that's a big one as well. Um, you know, if you reuse passwords across sites, it makes it much more likely that you're going to get your entire life hacked. You know, if somebody, if one site has a password breach, uh, and, and that password's out in the wild, then people can get hold of your entire life if you if you're using that same password everywhere. So you, you know, people should use long, strong passwords that are unique on every single site. Okay, great. Um, let's see, uh, which anti-malware or antivirus apps would you recommend for Mac devices? <laughs> well, um, you, you probably know which one I'm going to recommend first. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of malware bytes, but you know I'm, I'm a little biased in that regard. Um, you know, another one that, that I think is pretty good is uh, Clamex AV. Um, you know, they that's that's a good one, to, and I respect the folks behind that a lot. They do some really good research and, and good work. Um, so. Uh, I, I would say, you know, a combination of those two would be great.
Interesting question. Have you heard or seen the hacker group out of China called Black Mamba? Uh, I have not. No, I'm not sure that they're active on the Mac as far as I know. Uh, if they are, I'm not aware of it. Um, so that I, I suspect that they're probably more on the Windows side and I'm less well versed in Windows APT groups and threats. OK. Um, another question. Uh, uh, do you think that people working remotely, so now that there are, there are many more people working from home, um, has that caused a spike in malware or adware infections? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Our um, our Windows researchers have looked into that since the the COVID nineteen um, quarantines started, and we're definitely seeing an increase. I think I saw. Um, and it's not just malware, it's uh, it's other things as well. So, for example, the uh, I don't know if you've heard of the mage cart um, malware. This is not malware that infects your system. It's malware that infects a payment processing server uh, or a web cart or something like that. And so it skims your payment data. So you go to pay for something on a some kind of a web portal and if that portal has been infected with MageCart, they get your, your credit card details. Um, and we actually, I saw this statistic just earlier today, we saw about a 25, I think, percent increase in MageCart attacks uh, since the quarantines all started. So yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing an increase in malicious activity with people working from home. Um, here's a kind of a combined question. Um, what would you like to see Apple do uh, to make macOS more secure? And do you think 1016 will implement anything such as preventing you from using the profiles command locally? Yeah, that's a big one for me. I really hope that they do um, add that that you know restriction on profiles uh, because that's that's the real core of the issue is is we can't really remove it but these uh, you know the, these uh, adware people have no compunctions about you know shelling out from their code and doing something potentially dangerous and installing a profile with it um, so I, I'm really hoping for that one, although I don't have any reason to. Um, I've sent it as a suggestion, but I'm sure many of us have suggested things to Apple that didn't come to pass. Um, uh, another thing that I would really like to see, uh, and, and I don't know exactly how to do this, is better verification of code signatures. So, um, you know, we mentioned earlier when talking about CrossRider that if you modify an app that's already on your system, it breaks the code signature, but that code signature isn't verified except on first run. Um, and so basically you modify the app, it breaks the code signature, but it'll the system will still let it run just fine because it's not checking the code signature anymore. Um, the big challenge that I see for Apple in changing that is that if you've got a big app like Xcode or you know some of the you say Adobe Photoshop, uh, those apps, if, if you do a code signing verification on them, it can take a minute or more. And so if you double click an app on your system and you have to wait for a minute before it opens, that's not really a good user experience. That's the sort of thing that we might remember from way back in you know, the, the very early days of Mac OS when you had to manage your memory and stuff like that. Um, and it would not be a pleasant experience. So I think Apple's got a challenge in order to fix that issue, but on the flip side of the coin, if they don't find a way to fix that issue, uh, sooner or later, somebody's going to use it to do something more malicious than just install a Safari extension. Um, kind of building off that, would you say that um, browser extensions are the kind of biggest threat to the macOS landscape right now? Uh, they they are one. I don't know if they're the biggest or not, but uh, one of the big advantages to browser extensions, the way that Apple has reworked them, is that 
you just embed them inside of an app. And if you can get the user to open up that app, you can get that extension installed. And then from that point on, it's not really something that can be easily enumerated. You know, back in the day of uh, .safari .extz files, they were all stored in one folder. There was a plist file that told you which ones were, were actually active. Uh, if you wanted to find out what extensions a user had installed, you just go right there to, to that source, that one place, and you find you find the answer. Um, with these new app extensions, uh, they can be spread all over the place, so they may not necessarily all be in one place. Uh, and that's that's makes it a little bit more challenging to locate them. So it makes them a more attracting, uh, attractive target to adware creators. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Thomas Reed, for taking the time to deliver us today's second session.